at times, strong personalities present themselves to lend their gifts, their talents to our people. Consequently, what you find is those gifts and talents in their own way lift the people just a little higher. lives with his mother and her parents. They move out of central London and they're living 15 feet from the railroad. Steam trains puff, 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 rattling past, backwards and forwards, smoke coming over the house. And over there, downwind, just across the tracks, are some slaughterhouses. It's the last place you would put the childhood home of a, um, uh, an individual of such artistry that he impressed hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Bum bum ba, ba bum bum ba, ba which is the beginning of Hiawatha. Bum bum beam, ba bum bum be, dum da 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 dum dum. I wish I was a tenor, but I'm not. This is actually my first encounter with uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Um, what an introduction. I love the highs and the lows. I love all of the harmonies. The rhythms are so precise and exquisite. It's like a meteor strike coming across the sky. They had never seen or heard anything quite as magnificent as this. I was selected would be meaning that he would be kind of just like me. So if he's just like me, I'd love to learn more about him. To discover this, you know, black composer, mixed black composer, that, you know, it actually makes you feel good. It makes you feel like, wow. He considered himself English in many ways. He also considered himself African. Uh, and he also was a, a favorite son of the United States. He wasn't born here, but we kind of own him too. Here we can take something which Du Bois wrote later on. He said that the life and achievement of Samuel Coleridge Taylor showed what could happen and what would happen if the artificial restraints placed on African-American children were removed because Du Bois knew Coleridge Taylor he knew something of the world that Coleridge Taylor came out of. If a man die, shall he live again? We do not know, but this we do know, that our children's children live forever and grow and develop toward perfection as they are trained. And first for illustration of what I would say, may I not take for example out of many millions the life of one dark child. Samuel Coleridge Taylor was an English composer born in London in 1875. He died from pneumonia at pre penicillin age, aged 37, a century ago in 1912. <laughs> Well, Coleridge Taylor lived in the town of Croydon, which uh, is 10 miles from the River Thames. It's an outer London suburb. The important thing about Coleridge Taylor is he was born in Victorian England 
and we have a lot of myths about Victorian England based on dreams and images of the saintly queen herself. In fact, life in England was pretty bad for a lot of people. Coleridge Taylor's father, Daniel Taylor, was an African from Freetown in Sierra Leone in West Africa. His mother was Alice Hare Martin. She was English. Daniel Taylor, the African, qualified as a doctor, I think you say physician, in 1874 in London. And he returned to West Africa unaware that Alice was pregnant. He took no part at all in the boy's upbringing. British or English society had developed, as you had over here, orphan institutions, asylums for the young, and abandoned infants and so on. And Coleridge Taylor, who was illegitimate, African father, English mother, he wasn't dumped in a orphan home. He was raised by his mother, who was 18. But she could only do that because she had the help of her father. His name was Benjamin Holmans. Benjamin Holmans was what's called a farrier. It's a word we don't use. Blacksmith is the one properly used today. A farrier is a person who puts the shoes on horses. Benjamin Holmans was a hard-working achiever. He raised his four children by his wife and his illegitimate daughter, Alice, and that illegitimate daughter's son, his grandson, Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Holmans, the grandfather of the blacksmith, played the violin and he gave his grandson elementary lessons and then paid for a professional to teach the boy. His music teacher, the one his grandfather employed, was a man called Joseph Beckwith, and Beckwith busied himself, as local musicians did, organising this, that and the other concert here and so on, and he employed, or had Coleridge Taylor, play at some of his recitals. I believe one of those recitals has come down to us, we know the name of the tune he played. So Coleridge Taylor, at the age of 10, was playing his violin at school. So he was distinguished in his school. Coleridge Taylor had a fine singing voice. He joined the choir of the local Presbyterian church. It was conducted by a silk merchant named Herbert Walters. And when the biography was published, it was dedicated to Herbert Walters, who had discovered the musical qualities in Coleridge Taylor. Alice, that's Coleridge Taylor's English mother, had settled down with a railway worker named George Evans. They had three children. She declared herself to be Mrs. Taylor and a widow when she married Evans in 1887. Dr. Taylor was alive for the next 15 years. This raises questions about what she told her then 12-year-old son about his African father. And eventually, at the age of 15, just after his 15th birthday, he starts studying the violin at the Royal College of Music. 1893, Coleridge Taylor won a scholarship. He changed from the violin to composition and he continued at the Royal College of Music until 1897. He did seven years there. It's amazing by today's standards, but if you take the fact he left school at 13, if you take the fact he was brought up next to the railroad, uh, downwind of the slaughterhouse uh, with um, a mother who um, somehow provided for him and lived in this extended family house and so on. It's quite um, inspiring. I think Coleridge Taylor's fascination with Longfellow started with Hiawatha. Maybe he had it read to him when he was a kid, and then he realized that this was somebody who spoke to him. Longfellow was tremendously important for various 
European composers besides Coleridge Taylor. Elgar's mother read Hiawatha to him when he was a child. Dvorak's mother read Longfellow and probably Hiawatha to him when he was a child. And in Dvorak's case, at least, there is a lot of feeling that a great deal of Hiawatha comes into the New World Symphony. Often when you hear music that sounds familiar in a certain style, it seems that you can catch on to something. So when I played this music, it, it certainly reminded me of other styles, um, some Dvorak, certainly Gris. The gesture in the, 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 the middle movement is to, to take something which is uh, in a major key gesture. You hear that a lot in, say, for instance, the piano quintet of Dvorak. And and you hear these rhythms like uh, at the very beginning of that where he goes. That sounds to me like it's attached to uh, the rhythms of a language which he might have heard. The interesting thing in the third piece of the Hiawatham sketches is the way he introduces the, the blue note. And a blue note is when you take a... When you flatten the third of a major chord, and, and what he does is in the violin part, very interestingly, much uh, later into jazz, you'll hear that kind of uh, uh, melodic gesture. And he doesn't do it once, he does it several times. And that's something which I, I, I hear very much as a Dvorak kind of uh, gesture. I started playing these three High Watson sketches, an early piece by him, so you wouldn't expect so much from a young composer, but they really are wonderful pieces. It's remarkable that he was uh, taken seriously, that he went to study at the Royal College, and uh, he pursued what was a classical musical tradition. Coleridge Taylor sees an announcement that Paul Dunbar is going to do some presentations. There's also announcements in the press about a new collection of poetry published in London by Dunbar. 
And Coleridge Taylor goes to find Dunbar. And he finds him at the house of a man called Henry Downing, the black American who'd been a diplomat in Africa and with his Irish-American wife, was living in London. And Downing recalls sitting in the garden of his rented house in West London with his friend Dunbar, who he, by the way, Downing, had bumped into Dunbar by error in Trafalgar Square in the centre of London. And Coleridge Taylor turned up. So Coleridge Taylor hunts down Dunbar, and then they do those cooperations in 1897. Basically, they put on a joint recital. How shall I woo thee to win thee my own? Say in what tongue shall I tell of my love? I who was fearless, so timid, have grown. One that was eagle has turned into dove. The from the meadow that leads to the boss is more to me now than the path of the stars. Which was attended by a number of people, including Alexander Crummel, who was the African-American founder or developer of Liberia College in Liberia, West Africa, qualified at Cambridge University in theology. And there were other African-Americans of equal import. It was very much a sign of Coleridge Taylor's status as a composer and of Dunbar's status as a poet. the distance between my humble cot and thy glorious throne. How shall I clung gain a year of a queen? Oh, teach me the tongue that shall please thee the best, for till I have my heart may not rest. And these two men cooperated. Dunbar actually, when he returned to America, he wrote a, a short article for a, 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 I think it's a New York paper called The Independent, in which he said, he gave advice to black people uh, thinking of visiting England, pointing out that, that uh, the, the, the blackness is not a quality. That's a, you, know, it's, you know, you have to be good. If you're good and black, you do well. Whereas in America, if you're good and black, you won't. Coleridge Taylor was writing the song of Hiawatha's, the first part, Hiawatha's Wedding Feast. He wrote that when he was 22. He finished the whole thing in, when he was 24. Now, of course, there's, you know, Mendelssohn and Mozart, you know, I mean, they're, they're, yeah, they're just a couple of continental geniuses, they don't really count. The time Coleridge Taylor created the Song of Hiawatha, 1898, 1899, Coleridge Taylor was the one. And Elgar, who was twice his age, was still trying to get a decent break in London, the centre of the music industry. <laughs> the idea of a black composer, one identified as black, was quite remarkable and it was a matter of great pride for, I think, black people in America and in England 
uh, and throughout the world that they had uh, somebody who was really thought of as a major figure. Uh, Hiawatha, the Hiawatha pieces just swept the continent and were performed a fair amount in America even before Coleridge Taylor came here. Samuel Coleridge Taylor's music had come to the attention of this uh, group of African Americans in the District of Columbia and they formed a society in order to perform his music. And since at that time the auditorium of Metropolitan AME Church was the largest auditorium available to people of color in the city, the society performed its concerts here. It may have been just coincidental that Professor John Layden, who was the Minister of Music here, was also the director of the Samuel Coleridge Taylor Society. They debuted some of his work here in April 1903 to a packed audience sold out with great, great reviews all around the city. Every seat was filled and there was standing room outside to hear Hiawatha. The most famous section of Hiawatha is undoubtedly the song Onaway Awake Beloved from Hiawatha's Wedding Feast. It's a great, one of those wonderful songs for tenor that you wish John McCormick had, had recorded. I don't know why he never did. He, it, it's rather difficult. But it is that kind of wonderful uh, Victorian outpouring for solo voice, and there are, it, it doesn't come any better than that piece. And W.E.B. Du Bois, the proud voice of black America, was a great fan of Samuel Coleridge Taylor. He did a pageant called The Star of Ethiopia, and he used a lot of new music, and he used a certain amount of Verdi's Aida, which has Ethiopians in it. But the figure of Ethiopia, he had in his script, for no particular reason, fall unconscious at one point. Just so the spirit of inspiration or whatever it was could appear and sing to her on a way, awake, beloved, because this was the high point of uh, black music and he wanted to show what black people could do because Du Bois was powerfully interested in classical music and he was tremendously proud of Coleridge Taylor and he wanted Coleridge Taylor to be represented in this and he wanted this to be a symbol of what we can do. Oh, 
often fun like if thou only lookest at me I am happy
Such a presentation in the early 1900s would have smacked, if you will, in the face of a culture that would say that the only thing that the uh, African-American church, or the Negro church really, at the time, all the Negroes could do was sing their, quote, cornfield ditties. Taylor would come along with a different perspective of music uh, to demonstrate uh, the versatility and the equality in the area of music. And that's historical. And I have a letter to Coleridge Taylor, written by Andrew Hillier of the Samuel Coleridge Taylor Choral Society. He was very excited after the concert here in this church, April 23, 1903. Dear Sir, our success has leaped way above and beyond our most sanguine expectations. We are overwhelmed with congratulations by letters from the head of our local government, by the officers of the great musical organizations of the capital, and down to our own humble friends. There can be no possible doubt of the completeness of our victory. We have achieved for you a signal triumph. We have captured for you the capital of the United States and will hold it subject to your orders. All without an orchestra, our only weapons were those truly wonderful voices and two pianos and a small organ. Mm. There's so much excitement for Coleridge Taylor. How is he significant to this segregated environment? Samuel Coleridge Taylor was very, very important to uh, a people who were largely disenfranchised, segregated, Jim Crow, uh, menial jobs, uh, poor working conditions. After the end of Reconstruction, when they started losing their rights as the Democrats regained power in the South, as they got the Supreme Court decisions like Plessy versus Ferguson that affirmed separate but equal in order to have something positive to come forward. It was a wonderful time for them and the word went out not only from Washington but Chicago and Boston, Philadelphia that all this great music was available by somebody that looked like us. I think at the time of Jim Crow and segregation, his coming here and being a black man of such genius and brilliance really impressed the people. And uh, they just opened their arms to him. When people have been oppressed as we were as a race, some of it still goes on today. You're looking for any kind of relief or any way you can vent your emotions and just be impressed and fulfilled within the heart and within the mind and uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor certainly uh, did that for us. Well, let's talk about the five choral ballads that were settings of Longfellow's poems about slavery. It was one of his big hits, not the whole set, but another movement from a Longfellow poem that I dearly love. She dwells by Great Kanawha's side, which is an extraordinary poem because not only is it beautiful in itself, but it foretells something that would happen after slavery, which is the northern New England girls who went down to the south to teach the freedmen. She dwells by great side in valleys one of the few Coleridge Taylor pieces that was not published by Novello. And because of this, it's the one in which the orchestral score is lost.
Well, uh, yeah, I will tell you, Coleridge Taylor, one of many things he could do, God could he orchestrate. He really, and you know, it's not flashy, it's just good. I think he learned it from Charles Villiers Stanford. You know, you got a good Royal College of Music education that took. Every once in a while you'd wish it took a little less because he always knows how to solve everything in the approved British manner. One of the people I haven't mentioned is Harry Burley. Burley was not only a composer and also an editor for G. Ricordi, American. He was their song editor. But he was also a major baritone soloist. And he was the baritone soloist for the Samuel Coleridge Taylor Society of Washington, D.C. performance in 1904. Oh. I have spoken before about On a Way Awake, Beloved, the great tenor solo from Hiawatha's Wedding Feast, but the most important solo in many ways is the baritone solo, which are Hiawatha's words at 
his departure, and I would have loved to hear Burley sing that with all the conviction that he could have. One of the tremendous problems with performing the entire Hiawatha in America is it is devastating to hear the final baritone solo about trusting white people. I think that Longfellow thought, if I say this, maybe it will happen. There was still the chance that all of the things that had gone wrong, that people would see that they had gone wrong. And of course, Coleridge Taylor was stuck with this for the end. This is why it's very hard to take that last section. You just say, no, don't listen to him. In 1904, they actually brought Coleridge Taylor over to conduct. That was, by the way, the first time they did it with an orchestra. It was actually with the Marine Band, which sounds very strange, but the Marine Band had started out to get string players because the new director had decided that when the band is often just wind instruments, could be a little bit raucous. The presence of the Marine Band was significant. As you know, it was uh, organized by Thomas Jefferson and is the oldest military band in the nation. And it's called, what, the President's Own? so that the idea that they would let a non-Marine <laughs> foreigner of African descent direct that orchestra or be even affiliated with something that he wanted to do, it, 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 was, just, it was historic in its time. And even as it could be considered historic today because I'm not aware of a replication of that uh, event in any, any recent time at all. I hope they were worthy of his music. I think it was very significant that Captain William Sandelman accepted the opportunity to uh, use the, the new orchestra that was a part of the United States Marine Band for the performance of the Song of Hiawatha in 1904. I'm sure that he was well aware of the racial elements involved in an appearance like that, but I think that this was primarily an artistic decision on his part. Samuel Coleridge Taylor was a well-known name in classical music as a composer, very successful. His success was bringing him to the United States for a tour. I think that Captain Sandelman saw this as an important opportunity to perform a major work and have the composer conduct. I mean, anytime you can have a composer conduct his or her own work, it's a tremendous musical opportunity. I think another reason that Captain Sandelman may have been very excited and very positive in having a guest conductor is that the orchestra was fairly new um, to the Marine Band. They had, had had string players in the past, but in 1900, Captain Sandelman made a concerted effort to create an orchestra within the band. So he required all new members and all members who had less than 10 years of service to double on a string instrument. 
So having a guest conductor conduct his own piece with the orchestra now brought a lot of attention to the fact that they did have a significant orchestra within the band. And then ironically, we have the performance the week of November 14th, 1904, and there's a bad review for the Marine Band. Captain Senelman writes to Mr. Hillier in the Choral Society asking if he could get a recommendation from Samuel Coleridge Taylor that they were a good orchestra. And it was important because he says, it is more than likely that the attack on the ability of the Marine Band, which appeared in the posts and which was uh, practically copied by the star, will be extensively used by our opponents. What was going on with that, Mike? There was a review in the Washington Post the, the day after the first performance, the day after they did the complete Song of Hiawatha. The review was fairly critical of the soloists, of uh, a glowing review for the Choral Society, but then it was also rather critical of the orchestra, saying that uh, at times the orchestra played badly out of tune. Earlier in May of 1904, the Washington Post had published an article called War on the Marine Band, and the American Federation of Musicians was furious. Members of the Marine Band were denied membership in that organization. There were several theater orchestras that were on strike in Washington, D.C., and members of the orchestra who were on strike were replaced with members of the Marine Band. So there was a lot of animosity, and this is nothing new. It had been going on for several years. So we've had guest conductors conduct a piece here and there. Uh, we've had uh, concerts where there's a, a number of guest conductors uh, that each do one number. Uh, but it wasn't until, uh, I'm thinking uh, 1998, it was our bicentennial year, when then Colonel Foley, the director of the band at the time, invited Frederick F Fennell to uh, conduct a complete concert of the United States Marine Band. You know, you could say that Samuel Corwards Taylor was the very first of that line. It would have been 94 years between Samuel Corbett's Taylor and then another major conductor coming in to direct a complete performance. It's an intriguing idea to recreate the overture and do a modern performance. The director of the Marine Band has a, a great interest in our history and, uh, and our heritage, and uh, uh, it would certainly be something that we would recommend to him. It's an interesting idea. Another connection between Coleridge Taylor and the Marine Band is Maud Powell. Maud Powell was one of the first American virtuoso violinists to attain international fame. And doing it as a woman during the turn of the century must have been a massive undertaking. She's a very talented violinist. The connection between the Marine Band and Maud Powell is John Philip Sousa. Maud Powell was the violin soloist for both of Sousa's European tours in 1903 and 1905. She was the first really great American violin virtuoso. She was America's first great master of the violin to win international fame and reputation. She had the largest repertoire of any violinist in her day, and she was really a pioneer American violinist in that being an American-born violinist, but being ranked with Chrysler and Isai in her day as one of the greatest violinists in the world. She was the first from many perspectives. She was the first instrumentalist to record for Victor's Red Seal label. As a result, her recordings were bestsellers. She was able to get classical music into the ears of more people than ever before. It's very possible that Maud Powell attended the premiere of Hiawatha's Wedding Feast when it was performed in London at the Royal College of Music. She was making her reappearance in England at that time, had based herself in London, and had given her own recital in the Small Queen's Hall in the same month, November of 1898. And we know that in October of 1899, Maud Powell wrote to her uncle, John Wesley Powell, who was the founder and director of the Smithsonian Bureau of Ethnology, to ask him 
for the aboriginal derivation of the language for Longfellow's poem, The Song of Hiawatha. This he provided for the benefit of Novello and Company. He provided a linguistic analysis of the Indian words. He said that they came from three distinct stocks of Indian tribes and that the legend itself was fairly widespread. He provided a schedule of the pronunciation that now appears in the score for the Song of Hiawatha that is used by singers now. She was invited to perform with the Liverpool Philharmonic and she was a soloist playing a Brooke violin concerto. And Maud Powell chose as encores two pieces by Coleridge Taylor, his Gypsy Song and Gypsy Dance. So that was December of 1900. And in 1901, when she returned to the United States, she performed Gypsy Song and Gypsy Dance in Boston, New York, and Oberlin, and various other places on tour. Learning about music history is one of my great passions, but my first love is the music itself. And whether I'm performing something by Brahms or Beethoven or Samuel Courage Taylor, what I'm looking for um, is not, you know, who was this person, what is their place in history, etc. That's all very interesting after the fact, but what I'm looking for first and foremost is, is this piece beautiful? Is it exciting? Does it move me? Um, is it interesting? Do I want to practice it? And in the case of the works of Samuel Courage Taylor, the answer is always a very resounding yes, absolutely. I first became aware of Maud Powell um, in my late teens when um, her biographer, Karen Schaefer, sent me a copy of her book, Maud Powell, American Pioneer Violinist. And as a lifelong student of music history, I was really fascinated to learn more about Maud's life and um, consequently about the beginnings of classical music in America. And I was also um, just really perplexed by the fact that I had never heard of Maud Powell before. And once I realized how amazing her life was and how important she was as an artist and how inspiring her life is still for all of us today, um, I've since then dedicated myself to doing my part to try to bring back her legacy. Maude Powell was the first white artist to actively champion the music of black composers, the first white artist of any instrument. And it's really interesting how she had gotten to know Courage Taylor in England and brought his music back to America with her and introduced it to American audiences. And of course, Courage Taylor was looking towards America for a lot of the inspiration in his compositions. And so it all kind of comes full circle. Courage Taylor's violin writing in its totality, he must have been one heck of a fiddler. So you have a twin legacy. One, the musical creations of Courage Taylor gave a great deal of pleasure to people playing, singing, and listening to them, and it gave a great deal of pride to people of African descent who could see Courage Taylor as an icon. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows like Jesus. Brothers, will you pray for me? Brothers, will you pray for me? Brothers, will you pray for me? And help me to drive old Satan away. 
one of the standard sort of misconceptions of Calvary Taylor's life story is that he made his visit, his first visit to the United States of America in 1904. He was um, overwhelmed, which is absolutely true, overwhelmed by the black community of Washington and Baltimore's reception for him. Uh, he was inspired to arrange 24 Negro melodies for the piano and they appeared in uh, 1905 and the preface to the collection was written by the race leader and spokesman Booker T. Washington. What you find is that the preface was written and dated Alabama by Booker T. Washington, but he certainly was either in Alabama or Boston, Massachusetts, the day before Curly Taylor's boat left Liverpool, England. And in fact, the commission to write that had come in 1903. And the majority of the songs that he arranged for the piano are what were called Negro spirituals. And in Coleridge Taylor's preface to this collection, he thanks a man called Frederick Luden. And Luden had been a member of the Fifth Jubilee Singers. He travelled around the world. I think they took three years or six years. They've been to Australia, all over the place. Luden introduces Coleridge Taylor to the music of his people which Coleridge Taylor goes on to say, just as uh, Vorjak did for Bohemia, meaning the Czech, and uh, I think he says uh, um, Greek for Norwegians, he was doing for African people. So the 24 Negro melodies are not a result of his American experience, but were the result of his image as a composer, and Oliver Ditson of Boston, Massachusetts, thought it worthwhile getting him to write these arrangements. And so Samuel Coach Taylor is now in the middle of that social discourse. Washington, Du Bois are sitting there trying to figure out what's the best way to advance the African-American will and desire for assimilation into American culture and being accepted as an equal. Both have the right ideas, they just have two different opposing ways to do it. And so we have this English composer who's dark like them, who shows up on American soil in the East. The Harvard Musical Association represented a high society, high culture, uh, particularly in the classical music world. And I think it's, it's extremely significant for a composer such as Samuel Coleridge Taylor to be invited to the association. They would frequently invite well-known composers or musicians to come to the house and be received uh, and given a social evening. And Samuel Coleridge Taylor was among those who were received in 1904. A small group of members would come and celebrate his presence. We do not have a program of music on that evening. HMA has an archive full of concert programs dating all the way back to 1869, but that particular evening does not include a printed program, which is unfortunate. It, it may have just been uh, um, at the last minute that they decided to uh, receive him at the association. Coleridge Taylor's Hiawatha Overture had been premiered in America by B.J. Lang and the Boston Cecilia, a choral group that was founded by B.J. Lang in 1876. B.J. was a member of the Harvard Musical Association from 1865 until his death in 1909. So his connection to B.J. Lang and B.J. Lang's membership to the association, I think, was what led him to come to this house. Some of the signatures here on the, the 9th of December, 1904, include member composer Percy Lee Atherton, and he brought as his guest the baritone Charles Dyer. Also listed is Stephen Townsend, another baritone, uh, who was a member of the association. I think the significance of Stephen Townsend's signature here in this book on the 9th of December 1904 was that Townsend was singing 
the baritone solos in Samuel Coleridge Taylor's Hiawatha's Departure and the Death of Minnehaha here in Boston with Boston Cecilia. He had written to the Harvard Musical Society, Boston Mass, in remembrance of a delightful evening, December 9th, 1904, S. Coleridge Taylor. To the Harvard Musical Society, Boston, Massachusetts, in remembrance of a delightful evening, December 9th, 1904, Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Wow, I should be speechless. And to think that in 1904, sitting in this very room with these particular kinds of books and signing these books, it represents the kind of passion and desire that all of them were struggling trying to get across the table. Not so much equality, but more so that you can actually touch it, read it, learn it, sing it. He was here over 100 years ago, pushing for the same kind of global understanding of differences amongst cultural groups through his expression of music. And he dealt with his private side of him in terms of what he is to himself and how other people see him as a person of color. It's what all people want. Access, opportunity, to do the best that you can for humanity. November 12, Coleridge Taylor arrives in Washington, first time in the United States, and a New York Times reporter asks him, Mr. Coleridge Taylor, what do you think of the American coon songs? And Coleridge Taylor replies, the worst sort of rot. In the first place, there is no melody, and in the second place, there is no real Negro character or sentiment. A month later, the African-American theater critic Sylvester Russell responds in the Indianapolis Free Man, we have no objections to Mr. Taylor calling coon songs rot. Coon songs, or rather ragtime music, is of the lighter class of true, genuine American Negro music invented, but not named by them. Ragtime is something that Mr. Taylor has not understood and will not understand until he visits some low Negro concert hall and sees how naturally it is executed in music, song, and dance. As an Englishman, it is probable that Mr. Taylor has taken the best stand he could. This touches on a musical divide Give us a feeling for what this really meant. He doesn't get that the question is a setup because he doesn't understand. He doesn't have the African-American sensibility. He has an English sensibility. So if Samuel Coleridge Taylor was living past the early 1900s, 1915, 1920, the Harlem Renaissance, he would have seen the transformation of how ragtime had moved into the classical lexicon as opposed to it being a social phenomenon at the turn of the century in 1900. And so his response is in musical terms. He doesn't know that it's an opportunity for lifting up the race. The reality of writing in the post-minstrel, sort of pre-vaudeville era was that many groups were subject to stereotypes which were expected to be followed in entertainment. And while it didn't reflect the reality of the people, you would not have had much uh, economic success if you didn't stick to these um, tropes. Rosamond Johnson was my mother's father, and he's most noted as the composer of Lift Every Voice and Sing. He worked in the Tin Pan Alley era with his brother and uh, another man named Bob Cole until Cole and Johnson Brothers, uh, African Americans were not portrayed as three-dimensional people. There were no romantic themes handled. He and his brother both were quoted as saying that they wanted to, if not change the format, at least expand it, have control over it. Instead of being the victims of the stereotypes, they wanted to, to consciously use the stereotypes for their own ends. Down in the jungles lived a maid of royal blood and dusky shade a marked impression once she made upon a Zulu from Matamulu and every morning he would be 
down underneath a bamboo tree, awaiting there his love to see, and then to her he'd sing. If you like a me like I like a you, and we like a both the same, I like to say this very day I'd like to change your name Cause I love a you and love a you true And if you a love a me One live as two, two live as one Under the bamboo tree If you like a me Performance of music from the turn of that century is problematic for some people nowadays. I think because they don't um, acknowledge that artists aren't as free as they would like to be. And um, if that whole spectrum of uh, composers and performers didn't uh, remain close to the acceptable um, stereotypes, they really would not have had any commercial success. And in this simple, wonderful way, he wooed the maiden every day by singing what he had to say. One day he seized her and gently squeezed her. And then beneath the bamboo green He begged her to become his queen The lovely maiden blushed unseen And joined him in his song As far as performers were concerned, many performers were not allowed to be too well-dressed or too smart, um, although the teams often had a straight man and the comic, and the comedian usually performed in blackface. This is a picture of my grandfather with a short-lived partner named Charlie Hart. And this is Charlie Hart out of blackface and Charlie Hart in blackface. Charlie Hart made a career of being a Burt Williams impersonator. He managed to make peace with the role that he played in order to make money. Some people did and some people didn't. My grandfather never performed in blackface and he never performed in baggy clothes. He always performed in uh, formal attire. My grandfather spent more time in London than I realized, and in cleaning out uh, the endless amount of papers, I realized that I have these pieces of sheet music that are signed to Rosamond from Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Now, I was familiar with his name. I didn't know the extent of his musical output, but mother being of that generation would run around the house quoting bits and pieces of, you know, Longfellow's Hiawatha. College Terrell Choral Society, and it says J. Rosamond Johnson, director. So apparently the relationship that he had with College Taylor was a stimulating, it was a, it was a profound relationship, perhaps because the men saw something of themselves each in the other. I don't know, perhaps uh, Rosamond knew a side of Samuel that people didn't know. The fact that they both grew to appreciate a, a style of music that uh, was pretty much unloved for a long time or that black people didn't really want to embrace. But I think that Rosamond and Coleridge Taylor, Will Marion Cook and Harry T. Burley 
were right in not letting um, public opinion deter them from preserving and showcasing and demanding that that music take its place in the canon of American musical forms. I prefer to think of him as a musicologist. His uh, more lasting contribution was to collect slave songs, spirituals, ring shouts, music of that, the post-plantation era. And because he was a trained musician, he transcribed these uh, songs so that now any church from, you know, Maine to Florida can sing uh, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen or um, Go Down Moses or some such like that. Rosamond Johnson, of course, was one of the composers that came very shortly after Coward Taylor, who was inspired by him to also do serious concert treatments of spirituals. And J. Rosamond Johnson's Nobody Knows the Trouble I See um, has a very special place in the history of Maud Powell. J. Rosamond Johnson was a friend of Maud Powell's. He had become director of the New York Music School Settlement for Colored People in 1914. And when the war came on, World War I, the music school settlement was hurting for money. And so J. Rosamond Johnson called upon Maud Powell to come and do a benefit concert. She was in Yosemite National Park at the time, so all the way across the continent. But she sped back in the train to uh, New York City to give a benefit concert. Now she knew that J. Rosamond Johnson had set the spiritual Nobody Knows the Trouble I See in 1917 for voice and piano. And at some point he had asked Maud Powell if she would transcribe it for violin and piano and play it for him someday. Well, she remembered that, and so on the train, she made this transcription for violin and piano, and she appeared at the Baptist church where this took place, and she performed this beautiful piece of music. She also performed Deep River at the same time for this audience. She gave them a full recital beginning with a Lecou Sonata, which was pretty advanced in those days. They said that the audience lips moved as she performed Deep River that knew the melody and the piece. And people were singing it silently to themselves. And um, when she finished with Deep River and then nobody knows the trouble I see, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. J. Rosamond Johnson was very grateful that she had done this. Coleridge Taylor did an arrangement of Deep River and put at the bottom, this is the greatest of them all, and suddenly Deep River was noticed.
It was Coleridge Taylor that started what is now the great symbolic spiritual that transcends being a spiritual. Maud Powell took the Coleridge Taylor version and made a violin and piano version of that. Deep River then became the first spiritual transcription for violin and piano that was recorded. And so it had a great impact throughout the whole world. When she performed it on stage, which she did do in New York City and in recital, it was hailed as the most effective bit of music based on American folk song yet offered to the public. You'll often hear concert versions of spirituals referred to as transcriptions or arrangements, and yet we don't call Brahms taking a melody that he didn't write, a gypsy melody, and making it into a concert version. We don't call that a transcription. So I think we really rightfully ought to refer to these works of Samuel Coleridge Taylor as full-fledged compositions. And when you think of something like His Deep River, of course it starts out with the beautiful spiritual that we all know and love, and it comes back to that same spiritual at the end, but in the middle, almost like a sandwich type of a structure, in the middle is completely original music of Samuel Coleridge Taylor. That was her favorite recording that she made because she felt that she was at her best in performance, but also she agreed with Coleridge Taylor. It was the most beautiful of all the 24 folk songs that were within that collection. recorded Deep River in June of 1911, and she had dedicated her transcription to Mrs. Carl Steckel, Ellen Steckel, because she was inspired in that evening in 1910 when they spent that time at the White House and her meeting again with Coleridge Taylor. Among the many friends that the Steckles, the Battelle family had, were the Tiffany family. And there's a lot of evidence of that in the house. And this is the main staircase of the house that uh, Coleridge Taylor would have walked up when he was here. And we believe that all these windows along here are uh, Tiffany. This is the room that uh, Coleridge uh, Taylor would have stayed in, as did uh, all of the important guests of the Steckel for the, for the Norfolk Festival. And at the time, it, this was called the Blue Room. Nowadays, we refer to it as the Sibelius Room. 
because uh, Sibelius is probably the most famous guest that they had, but uh, certainly uh, Rachmaninoff and uh, Vaughn Williams and Coleridge Taylor all would have stayed in this room. And to the best of our knowledge, the room is preserved exactly as it was and exactly as it would have looked when Coleridge Taylor was here in 1910, complete with poster bed, which was in honor of, uh, of their very special guests. Carl and Ellen Battelle Steckel went to great lengths to welcome not only their um, more illustrious visitors, composers, singers, but also all the guests that arrived, usually by train in Norfolk, to come to the concerts at the music festival, which took place every June, beginning about the year 1900. The Steckels also presented a certain image of the town to the public, that Norfolk was not a backwoods town in northwest Connecticut, but was really at the forefront of culture. Coleridge Taylor would have been welcomed in that fashion. Newspapers tell us that the Steckles greeted their guests with torch-lit processions from White House down to the music shed. Garlands, ribbons, all sorts of colorful decorations. Carl Steckel arrived in Norfolk in the 1870s to become Robbins Battelle's secretary. Ellen Battelle's father, Robbins Battelle, managed the family's fortune, and he lived in New York and in Norfolk at White House. We don't know when her relationship with Carl Steckel began, but it was probably not considered appropriate to have a relationship with her father's secretary. So um, it remained very much hidden until her father's death in 1895, which is when they married. Now, Gustav Steckel was Carl Steckel's father. He was the first professor of music at Yale, and his role at Yale had been funded and supported by the Patel family. Robbins Patel was an early supporter of Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. He traveled to the South, supposedly collected from the mouths of slaves these songs, which then were transcribed and edited and published and arranged, in fact, by Gustav Steckel. Among those spirituals was Keep Me From Sinking Down, which would later figure in the Violin Concerto of 1912. In 1868, they published this spiritual, and that was, I believe, four years before it came out in the first edition of the Jubilee Songbook.
bless the Lord, I'm gonna die. Keep me from sinking I'm gonna judge me by and by. Keep me from sinking from I believe that when Coleridge Taylor came to the music shed in 1910, he very possibly was the only person of African descent in the shed at the time. Certainly, the people of African descent in Norfolk were in the service industry, so he would have interacted with them as coachmen, house servants, but not as members of the audience. So this is the dining room of the house. And this is the room where the Patel family would have hosted all of its guests for the festival. Sibelius, Rachmaninoff, when they were here, and certainly Samuel Coleridge Taylor. So many of the famous stories about the Steckles entertaining took place actually in this room. And they, they brought the caterers from New York, for example. Delmonico is one of the famous pictures of a dinner in this room is catered by Delmonico. And, the other sort of famous aspect of this room is if you look at the ceiling, it's made of elephant skin. Another example of the opulence, wealth of the family. In uh, June 1910, Carl Stuckel, who had commissioned in June here this uh, violin concerto and this piece, uh, the way it happened was uh, they had performed his Bambula Rhapsody in June 1910, and they went to dinner at the Stuckel mansion, the White House up the hill. And after dinner, he had told his wife to go into the piano room while they went to have a smoke, he says. They went into the smoking room, and she went in and started playing, playing a melody on the piano, which was Keep Me From Sinking Down. This was all sort of a setup. And Coleridge Taylor said, what is that beautiful melody? And they went into the music room, and Ellen then played and sang for him, Keep Me From Sinking Down. Shortly afterwards, he wrote back from his home in Croydon to Stuckel. He said, I hope to begin on the violin work very shortly. Thank you for the beautiful melody of which I shall certainly make use. And he's referring to keep me from sinking down. It is strange that the remembrance of Norfolk and of the extremely happy week I spent there remains most vividly in my mind. It was all so beautiful and there was nothing to mar the wonder of it. This is the music room, and when Coleridge Taylor was here, there was a huge skylight, and all of these walls were full of pictures which were part of the Patel Steckel collection. Let me read another short excerpt from Carl Steckel involving this room and the June 1910 visit here, and he describes the various composers, Chadwick, Horatio Parker, Coleridge Taylor, Madame Gluck singing African songs down there in the music room, and then Carl Steckel writes, the next day, we took an automobile ride and got off of some of the main roads and drove through some of the fields of laurel 
then in full blossom. CT was greatly delighted with the wild, picturesque scenery of northwestern Connecticut. When he came home that evening, he retired at once to his room. When I came to call him for supper, I knocked on his door, and he answered, come in. As I entered, I saw him shoving some little sheets of musical notes into the desk. Some months afterwards wrote me that these were his first sketches of the tale of old Japan and that he had been inspired to make them due to the floral display he had seen all that afternoon. One of the great uh, wonderful reasons to come to Norfolk is to see the laurel uh, in, the, in the spring and no matter which direction you drive or even walk from where we're standing at the moment, uh, the hills are full of it. Seventeen miles an hour is the best speed on this road. Laurel would have been able to seed in very easily, and when laurel has been cut, it'll tend to flush out a lot faster. This is Old Man McMullen Pond, and the laurel is just starting in on the edges here. You know, just on the right day, you can take out the, take out the canoe and just you know just ride in the reflections of the, the mountain laurel. It's, 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 it's quite nice. It's even better with a fishing pole. <laughs> Spring had come with all its splendor, all its birds and all its blossoms, all its fruits. Black bear, uh, plenty of white-tailed deer and wild turkeys, rough grouse are uh, um, starting to make their way back a little bit. Um, rough grouse like this really kind of low-growing, early successional habitat where they, they don't like the mature forest like this. They drum, yeah, yeah. You, you'd like them for their music. It sounds like an old engine trying to start up in the woods. I love the, the rough grouse though. Cut. When I first heard it, I thought of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves because it's spring has come with all its splendor. I was like, oh Lord, no. The way it's written, it's real choppy like, really quick and choppy. And my voice doesn't want to do that. I'm a Verdiana, honey. I want to sing some Aida and a little Tosca and a little Ariadne. <laughs> Thank you.
The composers in whom they were interested from Europe at that time were uh, well, Sibelius, for example, uh, Rachmaninoff, uh, Percy Granger, although he came from Australia, uh, Coleridge Taylor, uh, a little bit later Von Williams, uh, Max Brook. These composers are very much representative of a time, and in their day, there's no question that they were extremely popular. Some of it will surface again and come back, and it's difficult to say which. So I hope that you have a few free minutes tomorrow and can come by and hear our performance of Keep Me From Sinking Down. Yeah, okay. Because I'm going to ask you afterwards. Okay what you think of this music, because I know that Color Shaler will be somewhat new to you. Well, certainly that piece will. You can imagine that all of these seats behind you were filled with choral singers. Right before they played the concerto, they had performed a cantata by Color Taylor called A Tale of Old Japan, which he had started composing here in Norfolk in 1910, having been inspired by the laurel blossoms. And so in this building, we're close to 900 people, all of these seats filled. And if you can imagine 1912, what people knew and were like then. And this was a big deal, and nobody had any idea that they would hardly be a footnote in history at this point in time. Yeah, well, it's, it's a lovely little occasional piece, and I can see why they used it as an encore. I, Sometimes in the uh, Coleridge Tale biographies, they talk a lot about Dvorak, and there's a, an element of that in it, for sure. The, the folksiness, or at least it sounds to me anyway, it's a section there a little bit to me, similar to the cello concerto. There's a lot of music from that time that we don't hear anymore, and this is an example of a very sort of pretty piece from that time, and I'm glad I had a chance to hear it.
we are very lucky at the Norfolk Historical Society to have three or four letters that were uh, written by Coleridge Taylor to Carl Steckel um, uh, concerning the violin concerto and um, its whereabouts when it was transported across the Atlantic. And uh, I'm surprised that uh, nobody in the Coleridge Taylor um, scholarly camp has contacted us because this would seem to be a, a place to start when researching the, the, his remarkable history and his connection with Norfolk. In the wet year of 1912, Coleridge Taylor was beginning to suffer from pneumonia and it took him three and a half days to die from the moment he collapsed to the moment of death. Other things must have been coming, so there's a sense of loss, a huge sense of loss. Coleridge Taylor died at the age of 37. If that had happened to Elgar, we would have more or less juvenile work. Same with Hulls, same with Vaughan Williams, same with most composers. 37 is approaching musical maturity. Time to have made the mistakes, time to have learned from them, and time to progress. When I first got to know Samuel Coleridge Taylor's music, when I first listened to it, um, it excited me because here's this composer that I never heard of. Um, and it was kind of mind boggling in a way. And this, I think my first reaction was, why didn't I ever hear of him? Um, so those questions started to form in my head. And how does someone become obscure? You know, dying young, yes, but how does someone's music not live on? Uh, so I was very interested in um, hearing more and more of his music, and the more I listened to it, I was completely blown away. Your question is, why did he lose, uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor lose his popularity after, let's say, 1920 or after his death? And uh, even today, very fine musicians don't know who he is. And I don't really have an answer to that. I don't think anybody does. My job, I think, and you, and all of us are gathered here together, is to propagandize him, to get him known. Because once people play his music and sing it, they're sold on it. Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Uh, I'm sure he's not the only classical musician of that period who is largely unknown today. But he didn't have, he was not American, so he didn't have a local cheering section. And the times were just changing, and people went from classical music into jazz, and that became the signature music for African Americans for that time. And I think the irony, too, is that you're in invisible wear. Um, black opera singers may be well received around the world, but I'm sure at 125th Street, <laughs> nobody cares. Which is is silly because that's a population that define that self defines itself and very narrowly. 
even though he's just as black as their uncle, but because he's not, you know, rapping, <laughs> then he doesn't count. I am s often struck by how these incredible pieces are neglected. And we always go to these, these great works by the, the Brahms, the, the Mozart, the Bach, and so forth, and, and all this music is languishing. What's fascinating about Maud Powell and Carter Taylor is that both of them um, were unwilling to compromise their artistic ideals. You know, they performed classical music of the highest level. As I say, the, well, Malcolm Sargent, Sir Malcolm Sargent, the conductor who very much admired um, uh, Coleridge Taylor's stuff, is on record as saying that the, the so-called highbrows uh, dismissed his music but he, Malcolm Sargent, who conducted it many, many times, said it's perfect, absolutely perfect. It's a real shame that we do lose sight of people like Coleridge Taylor and Maud Powell and their heritage because for us it's so long lasting and yet it's so um, innate now to our traditions that we don't even know that they, what they did and that how much they struggled to attain what they did. What a tragedy. I, I can't imagine what, what the reason is. I don't know why he's been overlooked the way he has been. I mean, because when you look at the scope of his work, not just Hiawatha, we need to do something about it. I'm glad this project gives us an opportunity to look and actually see what is there. We're alive now. You know, we have a new unit of time, and I'm glad he penciled it. So now we can do it. And get it out there. Yes, indeed, this is a renascimento. This is a rebirth, a renaissance of the music of Samuel Coleridge Taylor. So, you know, what is a legacy? 90 kids that, you know, maybe go on and have 90 kids or um, a poem that is still taught in school or a book that's still read or a song that is still sung.
of new enchantment can Such rapture as the darkness gives such rapture and the darkness. Of thy love, turn again unto my bosom. I would have it nigh for I would have it. Fist Jubilee Singers, uh, an inspiration for Coleridge Taylor. That would be an earthquake. Really? Yes. 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 Something very shocking about Samuel Coleridge. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were in New York for a moment. It's a subway. Yeah. 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 Very much.